Hello, everybody. Um, we're letting people filter in, you know, uh, in the age of virtual meetings. Uh, it takes a couple of minutes for everybody to figure out how to log in, and I'm sure people are wrapping up um, their mornings. Um, but in the interest of time, and because the meat of the talk isn't until I'm done talking and these wonderful humans will be educating you, I'm going to get started. And um, so today we're going to be talking about um, common pediatric pediatric rashes from a Black Lives Matter perspective. And this is so crucial because many of us in medical school, especially in our preclinical years, we're never taught the right, um, the way that rashes present on different skin tones. You know, when you look at um, medical textbooks, many of them are all entirely on um, Caucasian skin. Um, you And what we found is that different skin tones have very different presentations of the same rashes. And if you don't know what you're looking for, we all know this with rashes, right? If you don't know the pattern, you're never going to diagnose it. And you also won't be able to pick up on things that um, you usually do with other patients because you've had more experience with that. So it's so important for us to um, be able to do this. And then also recognizing, right, we have these great health disparities um, for our patients of color. And one of those is, is that we're not learning this, right? So i um, really excited um, to learn alongside you all um, with these amazing um, presenters. So uh, next slide, please. Um, I also want to give a shout out to, uh, you know, FMEC, so the Family Medicine Education Consortium is a catalyst, convener, incubator working in 14 states um, and D.C. Um, in the northeast of the United States. It serves 60 medical school departments of family medicine and 200 family medicine residency programs. The goal here for, is for us to promote family medicine and primary care to medical students because we need more primary care, right? And how the best way to do primary care in, in my very biased opinion is family medicine, right? Because we get to take care of everybody. Um, we also really wanna be there to support our residents as they transition into careers, um, strengthen the, the academic family medicine, create and sustain quality improvement initiatives. And basically all of this is really to stimulate innovative approaches to primary care um, and to foster that camaraderie amongst us in this region. Next slide, please. Um, really excited. We have our annual meeting coming up this fall in Providence, Rhode Island. Um, what a beautiful time of year to be up in the Northeast. Um, <laughs> are going to be amazing. So come for the leaves, stay for the camaraderie and the learning. Um, really um, recommend coming out here. If you have anybody um, like med students, residents who have some posters hanging around that that would they would like to present, hey, July 1 is the is the deadline. So get them out, get those proposals together so we can um, enrich this experience for you all. Next slide, please. Um, so these are today's speakers. Um, and I'm going to step back and let them introduce themselves and give their wonderful talk. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Audi Garcia. I'm currently a PGY3, T minus two weeks until graduation for me. So I'm very excited about that. Um, I train at the New York Presbyterian Columbia University Family Medicine Program, and I'm actually going to be staying on as faculty in this coming academic year. Um, and yeah, I'm super excited to be here um, and chat a little bit more about um, dermatological skin conditions um, from a Black Lives Matter perspective. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. I'm Hima Ikenadam. I'm one of the faculty members in the Columbia Residency Program for Family Medicine. Um, I train close by, um, also in New York City at Montefiore. I'm really excited to be here and um, aid Dr. Garcia in this talk that she primarily put together. And I really have to commend her on the um, effort and uh, that she put into this and also the, the real need for this talk. So I hope that you all will participate in a really enriching discussion with us today. And I'm excited to um, get to talk more with all of you after. All righty, so let's get started. We'll be talking about a couple of common childhood rashes from a Black Lives Matter perspective. Um, we have no disclosures. Um, and then really our goal for today, um, by the end of this talk, is to first understand the existing health disparities and the uh, diagnosis, treatment, and long-term management of very common childhood 
um, rashes on darker skin tones. Um, we'll be able to accomplish this by looking at six common childhood rashes. Um, and uh, the images we'll take a look at are defined by the Fitzpatrick scale, which we'll talk about types four through six. Um, I'm hoping that we can all collaborate together um, to come up with appropriate descriptors when discussing childhood rashes on darker skin tones and really examine the way in which us as family medicine providers can address health disparities through more inclusive visuals in our medical didactics. Um, and lastly, to create a list of actionable steps and resources to improve um, our diagnostic knowledge and treatment access for patients with darker skin tones. Um, so for today, um, I'll start by um, briefly reviewing some of the existing health disparities um, literature as it relates to this topic. Um, we'll review some of the common language that's used to describe rashes. Um, depending on how many of us um, join, we may uh, break out into groups or we'll maybe have like a larger group discussion about uh, six common rashes that often present in primary care offices. Um, we'll review the diagnosis and treatment uh, of these common rashes. I'll leave you with some resources. And of course, I'm happy to answer any questions um, as we present or at the end. So to get us started, um, this is an excerpt that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, and it's written by the first Black woman president of Harvard Medical School, Ashira Nolan. She writes, moving through the world as a Black woman, I am accustomed to not being represented as the norm. Everything from the hue of the band-aids that cover my wounds to the heroes in the movies I watch makes me acutely aware of my deviation from what is typical and expected. I am Black and female, whereas the world represented around me is often white and male. For me and many members of minority groups in the United States, the realization does not come as an epiphany, but is instead an essential fact that we must come to understand to navigate the world in which we live. And so speaking about her medical school education thus far, she writes about an experience during a microbiology lecture that she's sitting in. The class at the time is learning about Lyme disease and a professor remarks that a hallmark of stage one Lyme disease is a bullseye rash, erythema migrans, which typically appears three days after infection. And behind him was an image from the CDC of a prominent red bullseye rash on white skin. I don't know about you all, but for me, that's definitely how I learned Lyme disease. Um, in that class, one of um, Lashira's classmates asks, so how do you recognize this rash in patients with darker skin? And as you guys can imagine, the response is quite disappointing, but not unexpected for many of us um, that do this work. Um, the professor says stage one Lyme disease is hard to see in patients who are not white. So therefore, we don't depend on rash recognition for diagnosis. And so being dissatisfied with this, um, Lashara begins to wonder about the consequences of this for Black patients. She asks herself if the diagnosis of Lyme disease is delayed in Black, black and Brown patients and if they present with more advanced disease. Um, and in fact, what she finds is that um, she looks at one study, for example, the, the literature is very consistent with what she already knows, um, and mainly that there is a higher proportion of diagnosis of arthritis, which is actually a late stage Lyme disease complication, and also a lower proportion of diagnoses of erythema migrans among Black patients when you compare that to their white counterparts. So for me, in reading this um, article and this excerpt, um, the overarching lesson is that really our medical school education has in part failed to teach us how to recognize rashes in Black and Brown patients which of course has significant and unacceptable adverse consequences, including delaying diagnosis um, and really ha having these patients come to our offices at more progressed points of disease. Next slide. Um, and then in doing my own research, I wanted to learn a little bit more about um, health disparities in dermatology as it relates to this topic. So we probably, many of us know that health disparities exist across arguably every facet of medicine. And so in preparing for this workshop, it was actually very difficult to find scientific papers that related to disparities in dermatology and specifically the identification of rashes in children of darker skin complexions. And this in and of itself kind of highlights the problem that we have. One study that I did find um, found a correlation between Black race and eczema, so the prevalence being 15.9% in Black patients compared to only 9.7% in white children. Another study found that Black children are three times more likely to be seen for eczema compared to their white counterparts, 
again, suggesting increased severity of disease. Um, one could postulate that this may be due to a number of things, delay in recognition, issues with access to care, or any other number of issues. And then thinking specifically about the education that we receive in medicine, one study found that 52.4% of chief residents and almost 66% of program directors surveyed reported that their residency had didactics that included um, skin of color represented. And this was specific to derm, derm residencies. I didn't find a similar paper um, that talked about primary care. Next slide. Um, and so speaking a bit more um, about education, the Journal of American Academy of Dermatology actually published an analysis of major textbooks and other educational and training resources in dermatology. They specifically looked at program guides from the AAD annual meetings from 1996 to 2005, and seven key textbooks for dermatologists um, and generalists that we use as resources when we're thinking about um, dermatological conditions. They found that only 2% of teaching events at that AAD annual meeting from 1996 to 2005 actually focused on skin of color, and that out of 370 events every year, only eight were devoted to skin of color. Oh. The table, yeah. So the table, it's pretty astounding. So the table that you see in this slide um, demonstrates the per skin, uh, percent of skin images pertaining to people of darker complexions in the most common textbooks that are used. Um, and you see it gets progressively worse. So Bologna has about 19%, goes down to Freeburg only 15, Brooke 12%, Fitzpatrick the fifth edition 11 um, from 10% in the fourth edition, and then Sawyer and Habib have the lowest. Um, oh. So really all of these papers suggest that we're really not doing enough to learn about skin findings um, in darker complexions, or we're actually taking an active approach to understand skin findings in a more equitable and ubiquitous manner um, that doesn't just focus on one skin tone. And then I'll let Hima take it away for the next slide. So here you see um, the Fitzpatrick skin scale. Um, it was designed with the intention of producing a more ob objective academic way of looking at various different mm -hmm. skin types and their association with risk of skin cancer with type one being the most UV light sensitive and having the highest risk for skin cancer and over at number six being the most UV resistant and having a lower risk of skin cancer but um, as we are finding out, this this scale, first of all, in its creation itself is not inclusive. It was created by a white dermatologist. The first iteration of the scale only actually included the first four skin types, and in a later iteration then included the darker five and six skin types to include individuals of other races and ethnicities, inclusive of Asian, Indian, African-American, et cetera. Um, and furthermore, once this scale has been put into use, we have found that many of us medical providers are still using it incorrectly by making correlations between different skin subtypes and perceived race, et cetera. Um, and furthermore, we know that perceived race and skin phenotype is um, not a completely accurate predictor of skin sensitivity. So that all that to say, we're presenting this skill because this is what is often used in the literature. It has its caveats and we need to think critically about that when we're utilizing it in describing various different rashes and understand that there may be a part of this scale that's perpetuating inequities. So before we go into looking at um, skin rashes as a group, we wanted to just make sure that we quickly review the terminology we use to describe various primary skin findings and how these skin findings evolve over time. Um, so very quickly, I'll review these that I'm sure most of you are very familiar with. Um, so macules are the flat, well-circumscribed lesions. They're flat in terms of being less than a centimeter in size versus papules also being circumscribed and small, but elevated. Nodules, are circumscribed solid elevations over a centimeter in size versus the plaques being elevated palpable, but having that flat plateau type like you would see in psoriasis. Uh, pustules are circumscribed sol solid elevations with purulent fluid, usually less than a centimeter in size versus vesicles, also fluid filled small um, elevations, but typically with that clear fluid like you would see in HSV and VZV infections. And finally, bulli, 
are circumscribed solid elevations with fluid that are larger, greater than a centimeter in size, like in pemphicoid um, bullets, et cetera. So as skin findings evolve, we have various different terminology that we use to describe what's happening. Um, atrophy, it describes a loss of epidermis, dermis, or both that creates this thin translucent wrinkles um, appearance of the skin. Blood vessels may be apparent underneath. Crusts designate dried exudate that can be from various different types of fluid, blood, ser blood serum pus on a skin surface. Erosions represent breaks in epidermis with extension into the dermis that can heal without scarring versus oh scars, as you see below, um, denoting permanent fibrotic skin changes that are due to tissue injury. Scaling designates the thickened keratin layered skin. It's easily detachable. Ulcers are circumscribed areas of skin loss extending into the dermis and often will impair the vascular supply. And fissures are the splits in the epidermis that just barely extend into the dermis. All right, so now I guess will be the time to see how many people have joined us today. Yeah, so Scott messaged me. I think we're going to do two um, breakout groups, um, and we'll do those for about seven minutes. Um, and then what we'll do is I think you all received an email today with some images. Um, so what I want both of the groups to do is to kind of take a look at the images in that packet and then together come up with some ways to describe what you're seeing. So um, a lot of the literature and a lot of what we've learned, you often hear the word like erythema, mm -hmm. for example, to describe rashes. So start thinking of like in skin of color, how might you describe some of these things that you're going to see mm -hmm. without necessarily using that word? Um, so think about how to describe what you're seeing. Think about maybe your top two or three differential and then um, happy to have all of you talk. But when we come back, if you want, you can assign someone to kind of report back what you all discussed. And then there'll be six rashes. Um, try to get through as many as possible. Um, and then we'll come back, back and discuss. Thank you, everyone, for participating. Um, I realize uh, Hima and I were a little mean, and we're just asking you to look at these photos with no clinical context, but um, they say a picture is worth a, a thousand words. So um, how was that experience for you all before we go into the rashes? I thought it was a good experience just to like pause before, um, you know, of thinking of like how to say it different, the way you phrase it of just kind of like, how would you describe it? Like, I think some of those are so automatic, but um, like practicing saying hyper or hypopigmented instead of like some of the terms I, I typically use that are more geared towards white skin. Definitely. And kind of, you know, some of the things still apply, like when you're describing these things, you might still like mention, you know, size, where on the body, like, the, is it just a face? Is it like a photo, like sun exposed distribution? Is it the trunk, uh, the extremities? Um, and then thinking more about like, does it look more violaceous and darker skin tones rather than like, um, like an erythematous face? It might just look sometimes people, I had a patient recently anecdotally who came in and told me, doctor, I have these bruises, these bruises, these bruises. And we kept getting CBCs and like the hemoglobin is fine. The platelets are fine. And it's more so that she had a different kind of rash, a different diagnosis, but on her skin, it was appearing as like a purplish hue and not necessarily what we're accustomed to seeing like the erythema. So, um, so now what we'll do is we'll go through um, each of the rashes that you all were looking at um, and give you a little bit more context. So the first rash was actually seborrheic dermatitis, which uh, in our group, somebody um, did put that on their differential. And I think what I'm used to seeing is cradle cap. So that photo um, where you're seeing all like this yellowish scale on the baby's head. That's usually how we tend to learn seborrheic der dermatitis in medical school. At least that's how I learned it, but it can look a number of different ways and involve many different areas, as you can see, um, like around the hairline, the neck, um, the nasolabial folds, like the upper lip. Um, and then as some of you mentioned, um, you see maybe some hyper or hypopigmented areas. Um, so moving on to the next slide, I'll give you a little bit more information about seborrheic dermatitis. So 
Um, it's caused by abnormalities in sebum production, usually the presence of Malassezia furfur. Um, and as far as like ways to describe, you tend to see some loose, greasy scales. It can you can have macules, you can have plaques. Um, and then as many of you picked up, you can have both both hypo and hyperpigmented areas, though in darker skin. Um, some people like will describe it as erythematous, whereas in darker skin tones, what you tend to see is that hypo and hyperpigment uh, pigmentation. And then as far as like areas of involvement, it tends to affect the scalp, the nasal labial folds, the eyebrows, the ears, neck, and the intertriginous areas. Um, thankfully for us, as I've said, a picture is worth a thousand words, so you don't need to send any studies. You can actually diagnose this clinically. Um, and then your differential can include tinea capitis, psoriasis, atopic dermatitis, which I, at least in our group, a couple of you had mentioned that. Um, and then as far as treatment, we tend to focus on emollients if disease is not too severe um, and like mild non-medicated shampoos. And then if you need to, you can use like low potency um, steroids. Um, and the good thing is this is very benign and is very self-limiting. So you can reassure all of your patients. Next slide. And so the next one, I think you all had the image of um, the flexural surface. Um, and so this is actually tinea versicolor. Um, and for tinea versicolor, as you can see, you tend to see a lot of hypopigmentation, um, some information about tinea. You can go ahead and email on the next slide. So you can have um, a filamentous stage of the dimorphic yeast of Malassezia genus. Um, usually you see those hyper and hypopigmented areas. So in darker skin tones, we tend to see more hypopigmentation, which is what you all saw in the photos that I provided. Um, you can have papules, macules, patches. You can also have plaques with scale. So sometimes it can be a little confusing um, in thinking about is it like sub seborrheic dermatitis, but it tends to have like a little bit of a different distribution, um, mainly the upper face, the chest, the back, and the upper arms. Um, this is also a clinical diagnosis, but you can do a scrape test with KOH um, to look for high VN spores if the differential is um, still unclear. And then, as I mentioned, for the differential, it can look very similar to seborrheic uh, dermatitis, just has a little bit of a different, um, uh, like, surfaces that it affects. And then you can also consider pityriasis ro rosea or alba. You can also consider vitiligo on the differential. For this, we tend to use topical antifungals. And if you have, like, a widespread infection, you can consider um, more, like, oral antifungals as needed. And then this is varicella. So it's one of the many viral examples that uh, we learn in our training. Um, can go ahead and move on to the next slide. So for varicella, as you all know, also known as the chicken pox, is caused by the varicella soster virus. Um, it spreads via respiratory droplets and skin vesicles. It can present with fever and general malaise. Um, you tend to see these vesculopustular eruptions on darker skin tones. You may describe these as like red or purple macules that then turn into central papules and then vesicles, pustules, and ultimately crusts when the infection is healing. And uh, I think uh, many people in our group mentioned it's kind of everywhere. We were kind of trying to pinpoint all of the parts of the body that we saw the rash. Um, and so that's sort of how chicken pox presents. Um, and the diagnosis, again, is clinical, but you can also culture lesions or obtain serologies if the diagnosis is unclear. And the diagnosis does include eczema herpeticum, dermatitis herpetiformis, and then some other viral exemptoms like measles, coxsackie. Um, and then for these, you usually use your antihistamines and the calamine lotions because of a very pruritic uh, rash. You can use Tylenol. And then in really severe disease or if patients are immunocompromised, you can consider acyclovir. And then the wonderful thing about chickenpox is that we now have a vaccine. So as far as your prevention, that's sort of the key. All right. These next images were actually of measles, which has uh, sadly uh, become more something what we see than we used to before. 
Um, and we'll go into some fun facts. So measles, a viral illness caused by a virus in the Paramyxoviridae family. It's spread via respiratory droplets and presents as fever in the classic, you know, medical school study acronym is the three C's, right? Congestion, cough, conjunctivitis. The skin findings, um, as opposed to on other skin tones that might be red, can be on darker skin tones, these violaceous types of macules, papules. I can go back a slide so you can just see what those look like here on the face, etc. Um, and they extend cephalocaudally, so forehead behind the ears and spreads over 14 days. The diagnosis is usually clinical, though we do have options of obtaining serologies and getting swabs of the throat and nose. The differentials can include things like rubella. Um, rubella might include some of those, the Forsheimer spots that might help you to differentiate, those pinprick uh, petechiae that you see on the soft palate. Kawasaki's, which might be differentiated if you happen to note that strawberry tongue, um, scarlet fever, which has a more um, association with that uh, sandpapery rash, Coxsackie virus, and varicella, which we just reviewed. The treatment is ultimately largely supportive, like it is for most of our viral illnesses, though we do have options of vaccination up to 72 hours post-exposure or IgG up to six days post-exposure. For little kids younger than two, there is an, also an option of vitamin A to prevent um, severe infection in those kids with the highest risk. And of course, the ultimate primary prevention, vaccination, 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 that I'm sure all of you have been encouraging your patients to get at one and four. So this next group of images was a representation of atopic dermatitis, something I'm sure that all of you encounter quite commonly in your practice. Um, so caused by an overarching immune system activation that's triggered by both genetic as well as environmental components. It has many different phases, so it can be tricky at times depending on the phase that a patient is presenting in, in terms of whether you right away are able to say like, oh, that's atopic dermatitis and versus it being more subtle to you. So in the acute phase, it can be erythematous, of course, on some lighter skin types, but remember that on darker skin tones, it might be more subtle in the context of being that darker red or even a purplish blackish type of color. In the acute phase, it might involve vesicles and bullae, um, with some weeping and crusting. As you move into the subacute phase, you have a higher appearance of the plaques, the scales, erosions, crusts, and in its most chronic form, you can get lichenification, scaling, and either hyper or hypopigmentation. The body surfaces most commonly affected include the cheeks on the face, as well as behind the ears, um, and the extensor surfaces of the knees and, and elbows. Diagnosis is often clinical in the office, and you typically hear that um, history, like it's coming and going, it's triggered by different things, it's typically very itchy. Um, um, there are people in our group mentioning, that's all we, I want to know the history, not just the picture if it's itchy or not, because that helps us so often to make our differentials. Um, the differentials can include other activations of the immune system, such as psoriasis, though those are typically involving more of those raised plaques that are that uh, scaly, pearly, silvery appearance. Contact dermatitis that has that classic appearance of looking like what the trigger is, like the nickel earrings or the patch that's irritating the, the skin in the shape of the square patch that it was. And the treatment involves barriers as first line, like emollients, gentle cleansers, uh, topical corticosteroids for flares, and in its worst form of recalcitrant disease, there's the option of the calcineurin inhibitor topical. And then next, we are going to discuss this set of images, which was a manifestation of scabies. So scabies caused by mites, the Sarcoptes scabie mites, that burrow within the epidermis and spread via skin-to-skin -skin contact, uh, and rarely also by the infected uh, bedding and clothing. Um, typically very itchy and um, is presented in these reddish brown or often violaceous scaly papules, nodules, plaques in burrow formation. So you can see what that looks like here in this bottom picture with the ankles in these areas here. Um, often presents in these web spaces of the hands, flex, flexor aspects of the wrists, ankles, et cetera. And the diagnosis is often clinical, though we do have the options of pursuing skin scraping if we need to. Differentials include um, bolus pemphigoid, though 
hopefully you'll be tipped off by a more of an appearance of the bulli that present in, in that manifestation and other diseases such as dermatitis herpetiformis that might be associated with other systemic diseases like uh, celiac disease. The treatment involves permethrin and then of course your supportive adjunctive treatment of the antihistamines to deal with the symptoms of the pruritus, et cetera. Great. So we, before we move on to some resources, um, I wanted to see if there were like any questions that came up for you all about any of those rashes or like any impressions um, from looking at any of those images. Okay. All righty. So, um, so in thinking about this like presentation and kind of things I wished I had um, earlier in my uh, young career <laughs> thus far as a doctor, um, I kind of started to look into like what things would be helpful in real time in clinical practice as you have patients coming in to see you and like how we can incorporate this into like our didactics and for like all of our attendings when they're precepting. And so um, the thing that's used most commonly um, in our clinic and also now doing this dermatology rotation with the derm residents this month for me is the application Visual DX. I don't know if you all have this at your institution, but we're very lucky at um, New York Presbyterian that they actually, it's embedded into our EMR um, and the institution pays for us to have access to Visual DX. Um, and this application usually depicts um, skin findings on all types of skin tones, but there is a sub tab where if you want to look at what any of these rashes look like on skin of color, you have the option of going into that tab. It also provides you with descriptors, the differential diagnosis and evidence-based treatments for it. Um, and I think if this is something that's not part of like your EMR, or if you don't have access to it, or your institution like isn't paying for something like this, it's definitely a way to like advocate for your patients. Like this would be a great advocacy project um, if you all feel like it's lacking in your respective departments to kind of advocate for institutions to pay for this for everyone, like learners to have access to this application. The second uh, resources that resource that I wanted to point out is um, an, actually an Instagram page, uh, Brown Skin Matters, and it was actually started in 2018 by Ellen Buchanan Weiss. Um, and she is a parent and noticed that, you know, when her child was going through a lot of different skin conditions, she didn't have like a resource to go to or someone to kind of speak to, like, what is this on my child who's someone of darker complexion? And so there are some reference images there um, of many different dermatological conditions. Um, the caveat obviously being that these aren't being vetted by like medical professionals, but, you know, sometimes this is how... Um, advocacy sort of starts. And so it's it's a good page to kind of look through um, and kind of see some of the comments and photos that people have put there. Um, the other resource is Mind the Gap. So um, similarly, this is free. It's uh, a downloadable clinical handbook that was actually created in the UK um, between 2019 and 2020 with information and images on many common benign and concerning conditions on skin of color. And then lastly is the... Um, Skin of Color Society, which was established in 2004 by Susan Taylor. And this, um, their kind of goal is to promote awareness of a myriad of conditions on skin of color and to further not only research, but also education on both of these topics. Um, and so there is a membership fee for this, but um, if that is a barrier, they also have a lot of free YouTube videos on many different conditions that I found helpful when I've like talked to my patients or wanted to learn a little bit more about X type of condition. Um, so these are kind of the four I wanted to highlight. Obviously, we're open to hearing if there's anything that has worked at your respective institutions or anything that you're doing that um, we could bring uh, to New York Presbyterian as well. Um, that's sort of all we have as far as like our presentation, but we're happy to answer any questions or hear any comments that you all have as far as like this topic. And then you can also, I don't know if we put our emails and things like that, but family medicine, we're a friendly chatty bunch. So <laughs> if there's any questions that come up later, I'm happy to chat email uh, back and forth as well. 
I just wanted to say thank you all for putting this presentation together um, and continuing the discussion of health equity, um, you know, in Black populations. And thank you for your resources. It was great. Thank you. Thanks so much. Yeah, sure. um, Dr. Garcia and I have put both of our emails in the chat if any of you want to reach out. Yeah, and I think um, it's important to continue to have the conversation because if we don't talk about it, nothing sort of changes. And so the more of this we can do, the better we'll be able to kind of serve our patients. So. Yeah, I want to echo the fabulous talk. Really great to get to work through those things as a group. Um, and just as a hope for the future, I I um, gave a dermato dermatology talk at my with my med students recently, and they actually brought up that last resource that you had on your slide. Um, and so it's starting, um, but mostly it's still in that grassroots place where the students are bringing the like brown skin matters and and mind the gap to their lecturers, um, because I you know I had slides based from. Um, that my patients have let me take, um, but the, you know, looking for um, more uh, widely available ones. So yeah, thank you so much. These resources are amazing. And I'm so glad Visual DX is actually doing good work in this, in some work in this space. Perfect. So happy to stick around or let you all go ahead and if you're not in a barbecue smelling state from all these wildfires, <laughs> enjoy your afternoons. <laughs> and here are the resources if you want to look at any of those. Thank you so much, everybody, for your time this afternoon. Thank, thank you to both of you. And we will be posting a recording with the handouts of this in a day or two. So let your colleagues know. And um, thank you again to the speakers. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you.